Unfortunately, as global climate change and habitat destruction is becoming major concern around the planet, conservation efforts have, have been strengthened because diversity threats are all over the world. Notice that areas which are the most industrialized or developing areas are the ones which are suffering the most. And very little is, is untouched. You know, basically the cold areas of Canada and Russia, a little bit of Australia, a little bit of Africa, and a little bit of the Amazon. The rest of the world is suffering at the hand of the diversity uh, changes because the humans are pretty much taking over those habitats and destroying much of the diversity that was there before. Now, humans are not the only thing that limits the diversity of ecosystems. There's a lot of things which can affect how much diverse an ecosystem can have. Now, in the land, the major factor that's going to determine how diverse an ecosystem is, is the amount of water that exists in the ecosystem, the precipitation. Look at the fact, for example, that the rainforest and deserts are both in the tropical area. So, but the rainforest is way more diverse than deserts are. Why? That's because it has more water. So water is the primary uh, feature in order to establish the diversity of ecosystems. Food for thought, the fact that the scarcity of fresh water and the fresh water reserves are going down the planet. That's also are going to end up affecting the amount of diversity that we have. Second to the amount of water is the amount of sunlight that the ecosystem receives. Because the rainforest receives a lot of water, but other ecosystems also receive a lot of water. Think about Florida, for example. But Florida doesn't have an ecosystem that's as diverse as the rainforest is because it receives less sunlight than the rainforest does. But there are also other factors which are secondary to that, such as, for example, the presence of nutrients in the soil. So one way of looking at how well the ecosystem is doing then is looking at the evapotranspiration amount. We just talked about that. It is the idea of how much the leaves of plants are letting water out of them. And you see how in the rainforest there's a great amount of evapotranspiration. It makes it look foggy. All of those clouds are coming because the, the, the plants are constantly putting out water from their leaves. That is an indication of the richness of an ecosystem. Because it's a basically putting together the effort, the effect of sunlight and water. So it's a best way to measure how much a land ecosystem actually produces. The evapotranspiration in Florida is pretty high, but not as high as it is in the ecosystem in, in the rainforest. So remember, the primary limiting factor of diversity on the land is the amount of water, coupled with the amount of sunlight, which can be measured through the total amount of evapotranspiration in the ecosystem. Second to that, the amount of nutrients will also matter. Now, in the water, where water is plentiful, because of course you're in the water, water is not so much of a factor. So what is the major factor? Sunlight, or the temperature, is the major factor. Which means that you're going to have to have enough sunlight in order for you to do what you need to do. Which is why only the top of the water, which is called the photic zone, is going to be the area that actually has the most diversity, the most productivity. As you go deeper into the water, the amount of diversity will decrease because you have less available productivity because you have less available sunlight. But that's not the only thing that matters. Gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide and other nutrients which are required by the producers in order to do their job are also going to be a good indication of the diversity of the ecosystem. If the amount of oxygen is limited, then you're not going to be able to support too much life. We talked before about the fact that at the end of the life of lakes, a lot of nutrients gather in the, in the lake, so much so that there's a bloom, a great number, an explosion of produ producers. But then that covers the top of the lake with algae. And then what ends up happening is that the algae suffocates the rest of the animals and consumes all the oxygen from the water. So now that there's no oxygen, the diversity suddenly drops. So the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water is a good indication of how rich this ecosystem can be. Likewise, in the oceans, the area of the world that sees the most productivity is the area that has the most amount of carbon dioxide dissolved. Because remember, in order to do that photosynthesis, you're going to need carbon dioxide. Because it's one of the things, one of the requirements for the equation of photosynthesis. You need carbon dioxide and water. You have plenty of water in the water, of course, but carbon dioxide, therefore, is going to be a limiting factor. So wherever there's a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved, there's going to be a lot of productivity if there's also a lot of sunlight, right? Remember, sunlight is number one. That means that areas of the world which are colder, which tend to uh, have more carbon dioxide, as you see in the picture, the, the poles are colder, will have uh, more 
productivity during the months of the year that they actually get sunlight. So whenever it's summer in the North Pole or summer in the South Pole, the productivity of those areas blows out of, up and actually the ocean actually turns green with the algae bloom that happens because of the, all the carbon dioxide dissolved there plus the sunlight that's now hitting it during the summer month will actually makes it increase a lot. Which is why a lot of animals actually migrate from pole to pole, like whales, to make it take advantage of that productivity that happens in the poles. The poles are the grazing grounds of the oceans because of that. But you're not going to have that productivity if there's no nutrients in the water. Because remember, you don't need just sugar. You need to make proteins so that you can grow and develop. So if you lack nutrients, producers can't grow. And also, if you have, lack micronutrients, producers can't grow. So that's important in aquatic ecosystems for the nutrients to be recycled with things like upwelling or nutrients to be thrown into the water by runoff from the continents. If you don't have that nutrient recycling going on, the top of the water will be scarce of nutrients and then the producers will die not because they don't have light or carbon dioxide, but because they don't have the other stuff that they need to survive. That makes you think also then that either on the land or on the water, you're going to need these basic nutrients or the basic things that you need to survive. Now, there's two major kinds of these nutrients which are necessary. You have macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are the most important molecules of life. Things like uh, phosphates and nitrates and carbon dioxide and oxygen. Chemicals which are the essential chemicals needed by the producers to do everything that they do. To build those monomers, those amino acids, those uh, sugars, those proteins and things like that. So you need nitrates, phosphates, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Those are the most important nutrients. But you also need uh, other nutrients which are act like cofactors and enzymes which are going to be doing all the chemical reactions in the metabolic processes of the living things. And that's why you're going to need things like magnesium, like selenium, like uh, calcium, potassium, and all, all of the other things which show up in life forms because they act like cofactors in the enzymes. And later in the year, we're going to learn about how enzymes work and why these cofactors are important. So remember then that the presence of micronutrients is also important. Sometimes everything is right. You have the right amount of water. You have the right amount of uh, carbon dioxide or other nutrients. You have the right amount of sunlight. Everything's in place, but you're lacking a cofactor that is necessary for the enzymes that do the processes of life to work, and then production also goes down. And remember, if production goes down, so does diversity. Ecosystem size is also a major factor of diversity. As the ecosystem size goes down, the number of species tends to go down as well. That means that when we cut down and destroy habitats, we're going to invariably destroy the diversity of the ecosystems. Another bigger factor is going to be the presence of disease. A lot of times, diseases kill off entire groups of organisms within the ecosystem. And that's very common nowadays where human activity is, is making sure that new species are going from ecosystem to ecosystem. We call that introduced species or invasive species. Sometimes these species carries with them pathogens, bacteria or other, other fungus or other things which attack the native species which don't have any resistance against them. Kind of like the Europeans came to America and all the Indians, uh, Native Americans, started dying from diseases which the Europeans were already had immunity for but the Native Americans had no immunity against. So that means that as diseases spread around the earth, uh, this is also true for plants and animals, they have diseases as well, the ecosystems will suffer also because of that. So as you can see, there's a lot of examples of how diversity can be limited by uh, things. And it's not just the human effect, although humans have obviously an effect because we will mess with the amount of nutrients, with the amount of water, with the climate, so we would change the temperature, which is also important, the size of the ecosystem, and we're also the ones which are increasing the amount of pathogens flowing from ecosystem to ecosystem. So I hope you understand uh, how diversity is measured and why is, uh, biomes, some are going to be rich and others are not.